My right, wife wrote a letter to the judge and I told her, don't write a letter to them. I said, they're not gonna let somebody with a record like mine out. Well, sure enough, the judge let me out. And the first thing I did was go and fix. First thing I did. And uh, just the whole cycle started again. And I remember that I found out where she lived at. And I went to her house and I asked if I could stay there. And she says, all right. She says, but don't think anything's gonna happen. I said, I know. And she, she said, I feel sorry for you. Well, the little bit of pride that I still had, I got up and I says, you know what? I said, I'm not a dog for you to feel sorry for. And I walked out the door. And as I was walking up the street, it's like a voice showed me, you are that dog. Because I told her, I says, you feel sorry for the dog that got hit by a car that's laying on the side of the curb. I says, don't feel sorry for me. But yet when I, was, when I walked out of her house, I started thinking about that. And it's like something said, you are that dog on the side of the curb. And that's when I cried out to God. I said, God, if you're real, you got to do something with me because I don't know if I'm gonna be able to control my next thought, and I'd rather die than go on living without all my senses. The next day, I was supposed to go turn myself in for uh, under the influence. I had made a deal to do two years so that uh, it would run with my probation violation. I went to court, and the attorney that we had at that time had already appeared at court and they wouldn't take me into custody. They had postponed it. But the first thing that came to my mind was now I got another 30 days I can go fix. And this brother that, that was out of the club now had became a Christian. And he came looking for me. And I didn't want to talk to him. Uh, I went to the house and I saw his car in the driveway. And then I said, oh no, here's this guy. He wants to talk about God. I don't want to talk about God right now. And I went to the laundromat where my aunt was at, and she says, Andy, go talk to him. He says he has something good for you. He has some good stuff. So I started thinking, well, maybe this guy's messing around again. So I go back to the house, and he started telling me. He says, hey, he says, you know what? He says, I heard that you went to court. He says, you don't have to go to jail. He says, there's a place I can take you, and they'll go to court with you, and they'll take you, uh, you, know, they'll take you in, and you can stay with them. And I started telling him, I says, oh yeah, sure. I says, these Christian people are gonna go to court with me and the judge is gonna release me to them. He says, yeah. He says, yeah. He says, you know what? He says, he'll do that. And I says, with my record, he says, yeah. I says, look, I says, that's not for me. I says, church is for good people. I says, not for people like me. I says, you know, I says, I don't know that much. I said, but I do know that if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And I says, and you know, I so know that when you, you, you take a life, that you're gonna go to hell. And then uh, he tells me, he says, Jesus came to forgive sinners. And I says, and what does that mean to me? And he says, don't you get it? He says, he came for sinners. He says, like us. And then he goes, remember who you did this stuff with. And he was, he's a very hardcore person. And he was serving Jesus. And I seen Jesus had done a work in his life. As a matter of fact, uh, if it wouldn't have been for him and his wife, I wouldn't be here in front of you doing this interview today. Because they came after me. When we were in the club, I ruined their wedding. They got married and ruined their wedding day. They didn't even see each other for three days. They got married and a big fight broke out in their wedding and she cussed me out. Her brothers took her away. We took him, party with them, and yet she forgave me of all that. And when they became Christians, they came looking for me to tell me that Jesus could change my life. And God knew exactly who to send. I wouldn't listen to anybody else. And so, he took me to a Christian home. I believe that long before I cried with my voice, God heard the anguish of my heart. And I believe that, that in those days, those last couple of days, it seems like things got worse, but I believe that God was setting it up so that I was, there was no more self 
left that I could only go up. I was so far down, I could only go up. And when he took me to this home, as soon as I walked in there, I knew something inside of me. I knew that I had finally come to wherever it was that I needed to come to in life. And there sitting there behind the desk was a guy that used to be a hype whose brother-in-law was a club member. And he used to try to bring him around. And I used to tell his brother-in-law, don't bring him around. I don't want no hypes around my house. That's the guy that was sitting behind the desk. And he's the one that told me the plan of salvation. And I accepted Jesus Christ into my life as my personal Lord and Savior on that day. My wife didn't want anything to do with me. I didn't want to face my club brothers because I felt like I failed them. I didn't want to face my family. But yet, at that very point, it's like a weight was taken off my, my shoulders or off my back. And I, and I felt like it was, everything was going to be okay. And I had already accepted that my wife was going to meet somebody else, get married, and have a, a husband, which she deserved, and my kids were going to have a father that they deserved. And uh, God started to do a work in my life. It took me 32 years to get the way I was. I knew it was going to take me a while to unravel all that. You know what's funny? When I was in the club and I was active, I used to do things. Somebody would die, and I'd get up there and I'd speak, and I wouldn't shut up. They used to make fun of me. They'd say, man, you're always preaching. But even back then, as I look back, I knew I had a calling to be a preacher, to be a minister. I pray that you keep your hand upon their families and their loved ones. I pray that you continue to provide for them, Lord. And I pray, Father, that... My desire now is to go back into the enemy's camp and take back everything that he's stolen. God has blessed me richly. My wife and I will be celebrating 36 years of being married. My daughter and my son respect me. My brothers have... My club brothers have, have just received me back. Amen. I mean, it's just the, the love that I feel... They respect me. The, I mean, I just everything that the enemy used to destroy, God has turned it around to the positive. And I remember going up north, and I was in Teen Challenge. And at Teen Challenge, I was going to be the final speaker on a rally that they had. And as I was sitting there waiting for them to call me up, I noticed two biker-type guys come in, big guys tattooed down with long hair, beards, everything. And something inside of me, I knew who they were. And then they went out. When they went out, they came back in, but there was a third guy with them. And they called me up, and I started to share my testimony. And I could see movement in the crowd. And as there were this one individual was moving closer and closer. I stopped in the middle. I said, I'm going to blow my testimony here. I'm going to blow it big time. I didn't say that out loud, but inside my mind. And I asked everybody to stop, and I prayed. And I asked God to take control of every situation. And I asked God to help me uh, to continue to do, to bring him honor and glory. And after I prayed, I kept sharing my testimony. And then we had an altar call. And... An evangelist came to me, he goes, Andy, he goes, there's a guy that needs to talk to you over here. And there's this guy looking up at me, and he's got tears in his eyes. And he says, there's something I have to tell you. And he pulls out a gun. And I tell him, no. I says, I know already. I said, would you like to accept Jesus into your life? And he accepted the Lord into his life. He had come there to come and take care of, to take care of me. He ended up giving his life to Jesus. And it really, it was really awesome because it was a test of faith for me. It was a challenge for me. It, either I was going to really believe that God was going to see me through or not. And after that, I just kind of grew in the ministry. In uh, 1991, I think it was, I got ordained as a minister. But I had been preaching and teaching. But finally, I got ordained. I was ordained. Uh, when I did uh, get ordained, my club brothers came. They came to support me when I got ordained. My wife grabbed the microphone, made an announcement, and said, now he's not only able to marry, but bury also. So those of you that aren't married, it's time for you to 
get things right. And uh, I got approached by a brother whose name was Milkman and his girlfriend Gloria, and they asked me to marry them. And now they're married, and their kids are involved in ministry, and, and they're living a, an effective life for Christ. Uh, we're in, in Fresno in the city of Del Rey. God has blessed us with a church, with a parsonage on it. We have classrooms in the back. We just started a, an accredited Bible college. I'm known as a pa Pastor Andy. It's really awesome to be the pastor of a small town, a uh, country, little a town in the country to be a pastor. And God requires that I pastor that community also, not just our church, not just the local church, but I'm also the pastor of that community. We were given a bar. The bar, we use it to give food and clothing out. Uh, I'm believing that God is going to raise up a ranch for ex-gang members, a home for women. In, in my relationship with my club, I mean, it's just a blessing with, with, to be involved with, with my club brothers. I go and I preach and officiate for their weddings, for the funerals, and done baby dedications and those kind of things. And, and they're open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm mustering up as many Christians as I can to pray for the biker world. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's a challenge to live by faith, but God has been good and faithful through it all. I look back and I've seen a, a young boy with a lot of hurt, a lot of damaged emotions, but I see a, a man that failed quite a bit but I also see the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, and what he's able to do. If I'm ever gonna be remembered for anything, I wanna be remembered for that God can use anybody. I wanna be living proof that God can use anybody, that he's not a respecter of persons. He don't care who you are, what you've done, uh, whether you have degrees or you've never gone to school or anything like that, that, that God, can take a life and make you into somebody. There are few things as intimidating as a group of tough motorcycle guys. But to me, there's nothing more intriguing, inviting, and powerful than the sight of just one of these on his knees seeking God. Andy told us that he wanted to dedicate his testimony to Big Al and Lorraine Aceves for leading him to Jesus. And he also wants you to know that God can restore and even reunite a family, and he can use torn lives to help others. We hope you're enjoying hearing about these incredible stories as much as we enjoy giving them to you. You know, the Bible refers to stories such as these as living epistles, stories read by all. Please email us. We love to hear from you, especially if you've never written before. You can reach us at damascusroads at tbn.org. And until next time, God bless. program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and only with your love gift of support can it stay on the air so please write to TBN O Box A Santa Ana California 92711 or email us at damascusroads at tbn.org